The USAC Silver Crown Series began on the mile at Phoenix with a surprise winner. Jim Keeker came back from a near spin to take the checkered flag. Then the series returned to the Midwest. Then they came back to run the home 100 at the Indiana State Fairgrounds before a typical May crowd. Well, Larry, the weather was fair, but there was a tornado, a tippy tornado. Lilo McSpadden from the pole led every lap to win the home 100 at the Indiana State Fairgrounds. And then the silver crown cars move on to the pavement of Indianapolis Raceway Park, the V6 Twins, Johnny Parsons and Jim Keeker. Tonight, it would be all Jim Keeker. Only one problem during the competition. Yes, there was only one yellow flag during this whole race, and it's when a brake rotor exploded, sent Davy Hamilton into the wall, and he collected Warren Mockler along with him. Bang, hard into the fence, but he was okay. Oh, Keeker was not to be denied. A big payday for Jim Keeker in a V6 Chevy. And there's a look at Jimmy Sills. Blew the engine in hot laps at Springfield. They changed the power plant. He set quick time. There's the V6 Chevy of Johnny Parsons, but he would not be up to the challenge today. It would be all Jimmy Sills as they drop the green flag. The former Silver Crown Timeless from Placerville, California, would lead every lap at Springfield. There's a look at second place, Steve Butler. And we take a look now at the Plastic Express Chevy, the farewell tour for that car driven by Chuck Gurney. And it has been quite a tour. Here we see Rustin McClure backing into the fence. It shortens that race car up quite a bit, but he was okay. And once again, the winner of the Tony Bettenhouse 100, Jimmy Sells. Now we move on to the coin. This is not the way to haul into the first corner, Wally Pancratz. Not exactly, but he did miss the fence, so he did learn something over the last few years. As the fans are ready for the start, the green flag flies, and we are racing. Johnny Parsons set a new track record, but let two drivers slip by at the start. Tony Elliott leads the way in car number 18. A couple of guys get wide in turn one. But now it will be Johnny Parsons looking to the inside of Steve Butler. Butler slips just a bit. And he pulls off a classic pass. Butler's too high. He just moves right inside of him on after Elliott. He's trying real hard. Here's some traffic. L.A. tries the inside. Parsons goes around the outside into the lead. And That's all it took. He wins at DuCoin, his second career Silver Crown victory, but the first time he's ever won on dirt in a Silver Crown car. And now the famed Hoosier 100, the granddaddy of the dirt races. It pays the most money. Started in the sunshine, ended after dark. What a rough washboard track. The racetrack was not in very good shape. It was rough. It was tough. Kevin Thomas hits one of the ruts, breaks a suspension piece up into the fence, stops up there. Looks like the crash is completely over. It's over. But it is? Oh, it's not over. quite. Look at no, this. Leland McSpadden <laughs> barely moving along, catches him, and gets upside down. He had committed himself to the high side and had no place to go. As the action continues, some contact there, and Stevie Reeves clouts the outside wall. Another yellow flag. And now, last couple of laps, Ronnie Schumann is out in front. This, in fact, is the white flag lap. Remember the points. Very important right here. As Schumann takes the checkered flag, Swindell will take second. Butler takes third. After the Hoosier 100, we take a look at the points. Swindell leads over Butler, Sills, Hewitt, and Parsons. The Silver Crown title came down to the final race of the year at Eldora in the Four Crown Nationals. Where Swindell had to protect his lead, Butler had to win, and Sills, he needed a miracle. 50 lapper at Eldora out in front, both in point standings and in the race is Jeff Swindell, but look who's second. There's Butler. To win the championship, Butler will have to win the race or at least beat Swindell on the racetrack. But here comes Johnny Parsons. Parsons with that V6 on the outside, trying to go around Butler. He makes it around him. He's going around Swindell, but oops, not quite enough room that time. But he's on the move. Car upside down, Russ Gamester brings out the red. This gives the Holt Delrose team a chance to change tires. But the new tire they put on wasn't the same as the old one, and Jeff Swindell wasn't the same either. He did not go forward after that change. Here comes Parsons challenging for the lead. JP has that V6. That is an advantage on this very slick racetrack. Well, it's lighter in weight. It gets through the corners easier, and you can see right here that thing sticks and zoom right on around Jeff Swindell down that back straightaway. Johnny Parsons out in front, but with the Silver Crown cars, traffic can be a problem. 
Watch what happens. Trouble up in front, and it gathers in Johnny Parsons. He will be into the fence. His day is over a chance and another $10,000 payday. Remember, he won the midgets this same day. Tough break for him, but look at young Tony Stewart as he goes around Jeff Swindell, and with that pass, I think it cost Jeff Swindell the championship. Well, indeed it did, Larry, because right now Steve Butler is where he needs to be. He is out in front in the Kenny Jarrett Farms number 10. Now there is a good battle for third spot right here as Trey House goes by Tony Stewart. And fifth place will be Jeff Swindell. So the championship goes to Steve Butler. For the Kokomo Indiana veteran, his second Silver Crown Championship in a hotly contested title race. Steve Butler edges out Jeff Swindell, Jimmy Sills third, and rounding out the top five, Jack Hewitt and Johnny Parsons. Safety was a byword last season. We harped on safety during the Thunder telecast. Now, USAC has mandated the safety equipment, but Larry, it's still up to the driver to use it properly. That's right. It's up to each and every driver to buy the best equipment, use the best equipment, and maintain the best equipment available. It can happen at the start of a feature. This is Lawrenceburg, Indiana. That is Jim Keeker, a broken right wrist, took him out of any championship hopes. Now, look at Tony Stewart at Salem, over the wall, he climbed out uninjured, came back with a different car, and ran the feature. A great testament to the equipment these guys are using, that they're okay. But look at the small track at Ventura. Bam! Almost hit him right in the face, but the cage saved Wally Pankratz. The Springfield Mile. Once again, Dan Drennan in the white car. Mark Gerke was checked out and released from the hospital. Five months later, Drennan was back in the cockpit of a race car. We can't say enough for the safety equipment. And look at the start of this race. It collects a couple of guys that thought they were clear through the crash. But once again, nobody was injured. This was at Eldora along the main straightaway. This is one of the most terrifying looking crashes of the summer as Dave Dernwald is engulfed in flames. We thought sure he would be burned, but look, he walks away from this because of the equipment that he was using. Miraculous. Once again, a frightening crash at Raceway Park. 15 barrel rolls involving Mac McClellan and aftermath, a report from Larry Rice. Mac owes his life to many things. The safety crew did a fantastic job. And as we look at the car, it has some special qualities too. The roll cage we're looking at was cut off to make it easier to get Mac out of the car. It's 25% stronger than the USAC required 095 wall thickness at 125 thickness. It has sissy bars on both sides of the car, and the right side you're looking at is doubled. This adds to the strength of the cage. There's also a crossbar below the driver's seat that prevents the driveline from rising up and striking the driver or the fuel cell. Keep in mind that the seat belts held him in the car and the helmet saved him from serious head injury. There are some other positives that came out of this very bad situation too. Let's examine the crash first. As the field comes around for the start, you can see that Mac is out of line, trying to gain the advantage at the green flag. He moves alongside Rick Delardo. The wheels touch, and Mac makes a sudden right-hand turn. Mac then gathers up Steve Barth, who is under full throttle. Mac's car hits the wall, but Barth's car rides over Mac and slides along the fencing. Mac's left side digs hard into the pavement and starts him rolling. His arm restraints broke immediately from the incredible G-forces. His arms are then free to extend out of the car. A second angle again shows the cars coming together. But here are some positives. First, notice how the fencing does its job and keeps the cars inside the track, protecting the spectators. Second, Rick Delardo, involved in the initial stages of the crash, deliberately makes his way down to the apron of the track, away from the accident. This allows Tice Carlson to make another heads up move. He realizes that Delardo can't see him, so he sees a hole between Delardo and Barr spinning upside down. He immediately shoots the hole, again avoiding a crash. Great job by both drivers. And finally, look how quickly the safety crews are on the scene to attend to the injuries of Mac McClellan. Well, once again, to reiterate Larry Rice, there were some serious injuries with Drynan and McClellan, but fortunately no fatalities in any of these accidents. We'll be back with more. Stay with us. Something new for 1993, USAC has band-aided starters on all midgets. The starter was unveiled at the Performance Racing Product Show. In Cincinnati, Ohio, over 60,000 folks walked through there. Larry Rice, I think everybody stopped to take a look. Here is Derek Dong on the right. He is the designer of the starter for Tilton Industries. Manny Rockhold, a midget and sprint car driver, also looking over the new starter system. 
Yes, and Stan Fox was the first guy who really had a chance to try one of these out. This is a test at Raceway Park earlier this year. Stan Fox cranking away on the starter. There you can see his foot down on the throttle. The hand clutch, he's got it down, he's got it in gear. Bob East backs away, gives us a little peace sign there. He's ready to go. And there he goes, easy as it looks. A flawless test at Raceway Park, but the first public display came at the Hoosier Dome in January. Look who's in the cockpit, the winner of last year's Indy 500, Little Al Unser. And he really liked that thing, he thought that was neat. So that could make the push trucks obsolete in midget racing. We'll see them in museums in the years to come. Okay, midget starters, what else is new for 93? Well, I think you're going to see a lot of changes in the engine departments. I think you're going to see a lot more V6s in the sprint cars and in the silver crown cars. Something else that's new is going to be Ford Power. Ford Power in some of these race cars, and I think that's really going to be exciting and interesting. Well, also, USAC has named Johnny Caples, a longtime veteran of all types of motorsports, as a driver, a car owner, as their director of competition. He brings a lot of expertise to that position. A lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, charisma to the sport, and I'm glad to see him in there. And young drivers you like, obviously, Tony Stewart. Well, I think Tony Stewart's the guy we've been looking at. Kenny Irwin is good. It's going to be a good year for new guys. So that will wrap it up. A review of last year for Larry Rice. I'm Gary Lee. Thanks for joining us as we leave you another tribute to the 1992 USAC racing season.